Ben. I'm a geriatrician with the Department of Geriatric Medicine at JABSM. Thank you for joining us uh, for this special series. Um, next slide, please, John. I just uh, want to give a special thanks to our collaborators, which is uh, the Hawaii um, Emergency Management Agency, the Healthcare Association of Hawaii, Hawaii Association of Directors of Nursing, Hawaii Medical Directors Association, Mountain Pacific, Quality Health, and of course, countless other people that we've uh, We've had to call upon for assistance. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to just bring you up to speed. We have a variety of topics. Actually, I have like four weeks of topics lined up three times a week for four weeks. And this, this is just this week's uh, offerings uh, up and through Monday. And so we hope that uh, you will be able to join us. Um, today's uh, webinar is actually re um, reusing and extending uh, PPEs. It's 30 minutes in length. After a short lecture, we will open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, please use the chat box uh, to submit questions that you may have and the questions that we are not able to uh, get to, um, we will uh, please, uh, we'll include an, an FAQ um, later on uh, when we get to those questions. Uh, at this time, we ask you to uh, enter the names of um, your names and all attendees in the chat box for attendance purposes. So uh, unfortunately, we are not able to offer CMEs for the activity due to time constraints, but we will offer certificates of attendance for all participants who complete an evaluation. And evaluations can be found on our website under the evaluations tab following the link of the chat box. This session will be recorded. And this session, the recording plus the PowerPoint plus all the resources that we talk about will be on our uh, web page. Uh, so if you go there, you, and if you missed last week's, you can get all that information as well as uh, the coming, uh, the today's and the ones coming up. Okay, so uh, today's the topic is reusing and extending PPE. And we have a very special uh, guest lecture. Uh, this is uh, Kathy Owens. She is a, a chief clinical officer uh, of Avalon Health Group based in uh, Utah. Uh, but she has facilities in many states, including Seattle, Washington, uh, where they have experienced the ramping up and of their PPE and how to how to use them uh, and extend them. So um, she um, comes with a lot of experience, and uh, we're really happy to have her. So without further ado, Kathy, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's really an honor. And thanks to everyone on the call. Hopefully this will be helpful. And if you do have questions, you, we will have some time at the end to be able to talk about those questions. Next slide, please. We're going to be talking about a number of topics over the next few minutes. Obviously, we'll look at the principles of reuse and extend aware of PPE. We'll look at um, competencies, and we furnished you some sample competencies for your reference. We'll talk some about the options that are available for cleaning PPE, and also ways to access more uh, extended wear PPE. And sprinkled throughout this presentation are resources that you can use. And I've also um, shared some of those resources, and I think they've been uploaded to the website. Next slide, please. I love this slide. It says clarity develops as you go, not before you go. And we are living in very unique times. And it is calling upon us to think differently about PPE, largely because of the supply chain uh, has been quite limited in PPE. So some of what I'm sharing with you today may change tomorrow. Uh, we are trying to stay up with the latest guidance from CDC and CMS. And that, I think, has been one of the big challenges of this pandemic. So I just ask you to keep an open mind as we walk through some of these steps and as you continue to face the challenges that the pandemic is bringing. Next slide, please. So now we'll go into some of those reuse and extend aware principles. Next slide, please. CDC helps us prioritize how we can use our PPE by defining the types of situations that we may be facing. And I think this is, I always go back to these three principles and that helps me demarcate what my next step needs to be. 
conventional status is what we are used to. That is universal standard precautions. It's following the routine um, of what we've been doing for years using disposable PPE. And, um, oops, I just lost my slide here, but um, um, John, I just have a big bit. Okay, sorry. Um, That's okay. I think I can speak to that as you're pulling this up. So conventional is what we're used to and what we were trained in. We are now in um, uh, the mode of looking at two other potential statuses. And one is contingency and the next is crisis. And we are, we've been given permission by CDC and CMS to declare, after looking at our PPE supply, whether we are in contingency or crisis mode. This allows us to be able to think about PPE differently. Now, as we go through the next couple of slides, I want you to think about something very carefully. We are using different principles now. We've been using all disposable PPE for I think probably 30 years. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I grew up in the age of not having disposable PPE and many of the principles that we're applying now is how I learned how to use PPE. And I want to assure you that when used properly, when used the principles of reuse and extended wear properly, it, it can be a very effective approach to limit the transmission of an infection. It does take more mindfulness because of the tasks of donning and doffing and where do you place PPE what sequence do you use? Some of that same mindfulness we need now with the disposable, we've been using with the disposable, but the extended wear and reuse requires more mindfulness. But it can be an effective way to reduce transmission of infection. Next slide, please. We have provided you with reference competencies on how to reuse or extend aware on the use of masks, gowns, face shields, and goggles. I want to um, encourage you to think about using competencies and actually having people do a checklist. If you've not already done this, have people do a strong return demonstration. And you may want to do this more than once because it is complicated and it also will change based on the type of PPE you are needing to use. Because within each of the categories of contingency and crisis, the CDC does give us options of what types of PPE we may decide to use based on availability. And if you, for example, switch from a surgical, an N95 mask to a surgical mask, to a cloth mask, to a bandana, you may have different types of competencies and, and return demonstrations you need your staff to do. So I want you to think about that and your infection preventionist should be highly engaged in that process. Next slide, please. Once again, what, what we're finding everywhere is uh, everyone has embraced the, uh, the standard precautions how we've been doing this over the years, the conventional approach to PPE, and we all know change is difficult, but in this case, not changing could be fatal. So I do encourage you to embrace the reuse and extend aware of PPE with open arms, get your mind around it, think creatively, how do you follow the infection control principles and, and still be able to use PPE. Our goal is to protect the resident and also to protect you staff in the care of residents with infections. We don't have enough PPE of the disposable type to, if, to be able to confidently have a long-term supply. That's why we have to look at other types of supplies. You will need to clinically critically think through some step-by-step -step 
as you learn more about reuse and extended wear. And in fact, what I would recommend is every morning, in, um, and maybe at the beginning of each shift until everyone gets used to this, I want you to think about your unit and think about do I have a unit of general traditional residents and no one with infections? Do I have a unit that's mixed with general with um, general cases that don't have infections as well as residents that do have some type of infection? And the third possibility is do I have a unit that has residents who are either suspected with COVID or positive for COVID. And if you begin your shift and have your charge nurses and your unit managers, think about what do I have in front of me for the next eight to 12 hours? How am I going to orchestrate the use of PPE with the resident population I'm caring for today? That is an important step. And I would encourage the infection preventionist to partner with the charge nurse and unit manager to take a moment, hit pause, think about what's in front of me for my shift and how am I going to work with the extended wear and reuse PPE. And I think that will help you feel more organized and have a systematic approach to how you are using your PPE. Our goal here is to conserve PPE, but to use it appropriately. So uh, next slide, please. Let's first start talking about masks. And that's also one of the biggest questions that we get as we have been helping facilities uh, just to this new way of thinking. So next slide, please. Of course, with COVID-19, N95 is the preferred mask but we do have limited supply of N95s. So we do have to look at how do we reuse those N95 masks and how do we prioritize the use? And CDC has given us permission to prioritize the use of N95s. So of course, N95s are the best used for those airborne infections. And COVID-19 is considered an airborne infection. It's actually droplet but can become easily aerosolized. So we are treating it as airborne. We are asking from a, a uh, prioritizing standpoint that if you don't have enough N95s to wear all the time, make sure your team is wearing N95s during aerosolizing procedures. And those procedures would be the use of a nebulizer, the use of CPAP, BiPAP, AVAP, Trilogy, ventilator, suctioning, and also when you're doing the testing for COVID-19 because that triggers a cough. The nebulizer, we are encouraging facilities in anticipation of having COVID-19 residents. Um, we're encouraging facilities to uh, work with their pharmacists to see if you can transition away from the nebulizer onto multi-dose inhalers. With multi-dose inhalers, the resident may not be able to mount an adequate inspiratory effort to inhale the volume of medication into their lungs from the inhaler. So we are recommending that you use a spacer with those inhalers. Now, I say all of that because you need to work with your pharmacist on this. But we also know we may be facing a shortage of multi-dose inhalers or MDIs, and we may be facing a shortage of spacers. So we can, um, we can just uh, start the coordination effort, do some anticipatory planning, and work with your pharmacist and see what your pharmacy supply chain will be able to support. A little tip for spacers, you can take a small paper towel roll and actually use that as a spacer, but it doesn't work as well as a true spacer, but it does help uh, trap the medicine and allow the resident to take several breaths to uh, be able to get all the medication. Next slide, please. So in terms of masks, 
uh, uh, some general principles, and we'll go into some details on some of these masks. But in terms of masks, if we're going to be reusing them at the end, and, and you may take the mask off during the middle of the shift to go take your break, to go out and take a walk. Um, so, or you may reuse some masks from shift to shift. So when you are going to reuse masks, you want to be in the practice of inspecting those masks at the end of the shift. We always want to discard masks if they are soiled or torn. That's, that is non-negotiable. If anything happens and gets on the mask, you want to get rid of the mask. Um, if it's torn, you want to get rid of the mask. If the rubber bands aren't working as well, you want to get rid of the mask. But if you want to uh, use, reuse the mask, you can do it in the following manner. Basically, you want to put that mask in a paper bag because the paper bag is breathable. And there is some moisture that's been trapped because normally as we exchange air in and out, we are there our breath is very moist and that moisture gets trapped into the mask and you want to allow that moisture to be able to dry. And that's why the paper bag is better than using a, a um, plastic container or a plastic bag. And I know there are some videos out on the internet that show taking off an N95 and looping the elastic bands around a plastic container and then putting the mask in the container and a lid on top. The challenge with that is it doesn't allow breathability and it can cause um, it can cause mold to grow or it, it just is a good environment for the growth of bacteria. So we really want a breathable brown paper sack. You want to put the name of the staff member on that sack and you um, you want to store these in a place that they're going to be protected. So you want to store them like in a bin and have your, or a drawer where the, the masks are protected but you, and they're well marked. The competencies that we've shared with you also talk about with a cloth mask or with a surgical mask, how you need to store that mask in the bag. And basically you want to, fold the mask and have contaminated side, contaminated, touch contaminated surfaces. So everything on the outside is contaminated. Everything facing the staff member is considered clean for that staff member. So you want to fold those contaminated edges together and then place it into the bag with those contaminated edges together. The N95 mask, you cannot fold. So you will just place the N95 mask into the bag, always being careful not to touch the outside of the mask. And generally, the N95 mask can be used, reused up to five times. But of course, if you have trouble breathing through the filter or if it's soiled or torn, or if the rubber bands are not fitting tightly uh, or you can't get a good seal, then you want to get a new N95 masks. And I've heard people say they can use them for five days in a row. I've heard people also say that maybe three days is max. So you really want to pay attention to the functionality of that N95 mask and replace it if you're concerned about that. Next slide, please. So cleaning of N95 masks and surgical masks is a hot topic as well. And CDC does have guidance for this. And I do have that uh, reference here on this slide that you have access to. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some of the topics that are under discussion and under review are the use of the hydrogen peroxide misting or vapor machines. And um, I did provide you an article that you can read at your leisure to understand how this process works. But basically it has been proven to be effective in the uh, cleaning of the N95 mask. There's also been discussion about blanket warmers and uh, if they are effective, and I'll show you a study that helps give some 
shed some light on that topic. Also, the question of whether ultraviolet light is helpful or not. And I, the study that I'm going to share with you actually did some comparison. And then there's also the spraying of solutions. And I have spoken with several um, infection control experts uh, trying to work through this piece of spraying of solutions. And there's a, there is a concept that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about masks that are made of porous materials um, and different types of porous materials and different layers of por porous materials. Whatever you do to clean that mask has got to penetrate through those porous materials. So you can't just do a surface cleaning. You have to be able to have some penetration of the, of the treatment. And, um, and I'll be honest, I have not found uh, significant reassurance with some of the recommendations that are out there. There, um, there are studies that are being done, and I personally am waiting for those studies before I would make any additional recommendation. Uh, you are welcome to pursue looking into that, um, but right now um, that's not an, an avenue that we're actually pursuing. So next slide, please. This is a study I was uh, referencing. It's a collaborative study that was just published with Stanford University and 4C Air Incorporated. And what they looked at is they, they looked at two methods for cleaning masks. One was the use of heat, which would be like with the blanket warmer. Uh, but they were, uh, they actually raised the temperature up to 75 degrees centigrade of hot air for 30 minutes and for 20 cycles. They also used ultraviolet light and they provide the uh, specifications for 30 minutes here for 10 cycles. What they did say was um, they did use those two methods. They looked at the steam method, but they were advising significant caution of the using of the steam because of that filtration efficiency that I was just mentioning. Next slide, please. This is some of the outcomes that, and recommendations straight from that study. And you have a copy of the, this article uh, that has been posted on your website. Um, but they're saying that they felt like 75 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes is sufficient for disinfection. So that's a good measure. So if you're going to use blanket warmers, you want to measure what the temperature gets in those blanket warmers. And I don't know that off the shelf blanket warmers actually get to this heating level, but it is something that you can, you would want to check your blanket warmer, the specifications, and make sure that it was meeting these specifications. Uh, for ultraviolet treatments, um, they, did, they noted that they were effective and they also did not alter the filtration efficiency because that's the other issue with masks. It's not just trying to um, cover, it's really the filtering that we're trying to impact and we're trying to keep those droplets out. We wanna keep COVID-19 and other, other droplets out. And you, so you don't want to negatively impact the filtration. If you're treating fabrics, and all of these are some form of fabric. If you're treating fabrics, it, um, exposure to certain chemicals and heat can break down the fibers of that fabric. And that will then impact the ability of that fabric to filter out particles. And in fact, as the fabric degrades, the particle, the smaller particles have an easier time getting through the fabric. So that's the principle. So um, they have they have actually given some great data to help us make a good um, assessment or, or a good treatment approach if we want to chemically or heated uh, treat our masks to make them last longer. But once again, I'm watching quite frankly for some more studies uh, before we embark upon that as a treatment option. Next slide, please. I wanted to share this with you. It's also from Stanford, but this is, I think, a, a good introduction to the concept of homemade masks. So when you think about CDC says priority would be N95. If we don't have enough, 
then we preserve those for aerosolizing procedures. The next level mask that would be recommended is the surgical mask. And then the next level, and only when we're in contingency and crisis mode, do we go to this level, is when we have, is moving into the area of other types of masks like cloth masks. This particular slide, I don't know if you can see this well or not, but this particular slide gives you, um, uses the surgical mask as the reference point. And it uses two microbes for filtration to measure. And then compares how other fabrics or materials uh, filter compared to the surgical mask. So as you can see, the vacuum cleaner bag has um, the next best filtration compared to the surgical mask. But you've got to be careful with vacuum cleaner bags and HEPA filters. Because some HEPA, HEPA filters are made of fiberglass and they may have silicone fibers. So you, those are small fibers. And one of the areas that we are all concerned about is we don't want our, our residents or our employees to be breathing in fibers that might be harmful. So we want to pay close attention to how we use the filters and what the filters are made of. The next level would be the tea towel. And if you think about the tea towel, it is very tightly woven. So it, it does filter out more because it's very tightly woven. It's still not as good as the surgical mask. The next would be the cotton mask. And so thinking about this too, this is one layer of material. So sometimes what we do to compensate for the filtration is to double or triple or quadruple the layering of the material. And that's all well and good, and it does improve the filtration of the mask, but it can make it more difficult to breathe through. So next slide, please. I wanted to include this. I, I do wanna do a shout out to Dr. Sabina Von Price. Um, Dr. Von Price is our chief medical officer, and she has truly been in the trenches in Seattle with the COVID-19 outbreak. And um, her brother is a dermatologist over in Germany, and he actually wrote out these specific directions for how to make a homemade mask. So these are the directions that you can follow to put together a homemade mask that uses twill tape for ties. Next slide, please. Now this is a, a popular mask for cloth mask. It's called the Olsen face mask. And I wanna talk about this because uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's very easy to make. I've included a link on um, instructions on how to make the, um, this Olsen mask. I like it because it has the ear loops and I think it's easier for placing and it's also easy for donning and doffing. Um, what I also like about this particular mask, and you can do this if, if uh, you find a seamstress or you know how to sew, you can actually do this yourself. But in these cloth masks, you can make an insert pocket. And in that insert pocket, you can place a filter. And that um, you can also place interfacing in between the cotton. And that that interfacing helps give shape to the mask, but it also helps with filtration. Um, and then in addition, you can do a filter pocket. And then you can uh, insert filters and change out those filters. And I think that that's a great option if we're not able to have N95s or surgical and we move to cloth masks. Um, I would suggest that uh, you don't wash a filter and, and reuse it because it does degrade. Most filters will degrade and most are not made to go through a washing machine. What's nice about all these cloth masks is you can actually wash them in your washing machine. I would recommend, however, that if you're having your team members use cloth masks, that you take a laundry pen and get their name written on that mask if they, if they have masks that they want to use that they really like, then you write their name on it, but you wash it at the facility. Our facilities have to meet certain standards for laundering 
linens. And it's usually a much higher temperature uh, than, and sometimes additional sanitization that the CDC has approved uh, for use. And I think it would just be more hygienic to have the facility wash the cloth masks that the, the staff are using. So I do make that recommendation. I've also provided a link uh, for you to look at the CDC recommendations for laundering in healthcare facilities. And they have very specific guidelines. So if you go to this YouTube video, you can see how to make an OSA mask. Really suggest you think about a filter pocket. And then filters you can choose, <coughs> excuse me, include, um, you can do a coffee filter. Um, you can do um, other pieces of interfacing. Um, uh, most people, from what I'm hearing, are using coffee filters because they're, um, they're already used to have coffee go through them, and that would be less of a toxic kind of exchange for the, the human body. And so for me, I think the coffee filters make the most sense. And then if you have several layers of material and some interfacing in between the cotton, I think you've got an improved filtration system. Still not ideal, still not the N95, still not the surgical mask, but still ideal, I mean, still helpful. Next slide, please. So these are, uh, these. this is just what I was explaining to you um, a minute ago about be cautious of the microfibers that could be in the filters that you choose. Um, and I've already mentioned enclosing them between two pieces of cotton. And this is a New York Times article that is very fascinating. And it's extremely informative, and I think it's solid with the information it provides. So I provided that link for you that walks through a number of creative solutions, including uh, more detail around the use of filters. So next slide, please. Um, next, I wanted to speak just a minute about face shields. Um, next slide. Um, I do recommend, and CDC does recommend, if you're going to, um, in, the, in the setting of contact droplet precautions, you do want to have face shields or goggles. That helps prevent any entry of the organism into the conjunctiva. So, um, but it's hard to get um, face shields. It's, goggles seem to be a little bit better supply. I like the face shield better because it covers the face and it provides one more layer that those droplets have to get through before they get to your face. Um, this is an example of how you can make a face shield. You can take two pieces of laminate material and put them through your laminator machine. And then you can get the uh, window seal or um, insulation um, that you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. And you can actually put that on the inner aspect of the face shield and that helps bring the face shield away from the face. That's one of the problems with the disposable face shields, and those are easier to get now than the more durable ones. Um, they, they just hug your face and they steam up and it's just um, very inconvenient. But if you put some layers of these adhesive foam strips, you're able to bring that face shield away from the face. So if you take the two laminate pieces together and put them on a landscape, um, you know, like a long, Long ways, and you put long rubber bands or ties around, uh, you punch holes in the upper corners, and you put your rubber bands or ties, and you can apply the face shield. You can also clean this with your cleaning solutions. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about gowns. Um, there's a, these are all gowns that are suggested through the CDC if we don't have disposable gowns. And um, obviously disposable gowns are our preference, but we are running in short supply of those as well. So you can get cloth gowns. You can order them from your suppliers. Um, you can take a disposable gown and give it to seamstress and they can pull that apart and make a pattern. And we've actually engaged with the company to do that for us. Uh, that's a company that repurposed themselves for making wedding gowns because people aren't having weddings right now with the social distancing, so they are helping us with making isolation gowns. 
You can also use lab coats turned around if you need to. Um, you can also take patient gowns. Um, they're not long sleeve. Some people have long sleeve patient gowns. Most don't, uh, but you may be able to engage a church group to put some sleeve extensions on those patient gowns and they could serve as isolation gowns. There are some people using ponchos. They're like $2 a piece. Uh, they're probably your cheapest option. My concern with patient gowns is the short sleeve and also with the ponchos is the short sleeve. And you still have to determine how are you protecting the lower parts of the arms, which are likely to come in contact if you're doing patient care with the resident. Next slide, please. <coughs> So supplies are the big deal, and, and the amount of supplies that you have help you determine are you in contingency or crisis mode. And you want to enter into your QAPI process a statement that demarcates when you have decided you're, you have limited PPE supply and that you have to move into the use, reuse, and extend aware of these uh, PPE. And it is important to demarcate that in your QAPI because there will come a time, hopefully, that we will be through this. And there may be some questions as to why you used, what you used, when you used it. And it's, so it is important to have a QAPI process to reflect the rationale for moving into, uh, out of the standard conventional approach into contingency or crisis mode. So just a couple of words, though, on, um, what it means for reuse. So reuse means you use it more than once. And so we talked about the reuse of masks. Sometimes we reuse gowns. And sometimes to reuse gowns, you have to talk through with your infection preventionist the best way to reuse those gowns. It depends a lot on your facility, on your physical plant, the infection that you're treating, and what your availability of storage and space is. So if you are doing reusable gowns with a resident with an infection, you can, um, typically what we've done is we uh, put close to the door and usually behind the door, uh, commando strips, for example. And you would doff your gown so that you doff it and your competency walks you through how to doff the gown. And you then hang the gown with a contaminated side towards the wall, the clean side uh, towards you as you're hanging. So that when you come back in to get to reapply the gown, to don the gown, you are putting your arms and hands into the clean side of the gown. You can also use the resident bathroom if the resident's not using that bathroom. That actually could be ideal. And in some of these residents, they're, they're too ill to use the bathroom. So you could turn the fan on in that bathroom, that creates negative um, airflow, and you could hang your, uh, don and doff your gowns in the resident bathroom. We have not chosen to do that. Um, we've been using a, a very specific method behind the door, but we'll, we are continuing to look at that in light of CDC guidance. You can also uh, choose to, um, um, to have another location where you might want to hang the gowns. If you have a COVID unit, we're recommending the use of an antechamber with zip walls and that the staff would go into the antechamber. You'd have one zip wall and then you'd have another zip wall. And in that antechamber, you would change um, into and out of your PPE and you could don and doff there and keep your gowns hanging there as well. So there's a, you really need to walk through with your infection preventionist, look at your physical plant um, on how to do the reuse. The extended wear means that you can wear the same PPE with like patients. Generally, the CDC is saying you can wear a mask and face shield and you can use extended wear throughout your shift. It's really the gown and the gloves that need to be changed as you go in and out of rooms with residents. Um, so you could wear extended wear on your mask and your face shield, and then you can change out your um, change out your gown. If you if you're working in a general unit, like now we're all supposed to be wearing masks. CDC has said that. CMS has has said that. Uh, we've added face shields if they're available. Um, so everyone's already wearing those in an extended wear fashion. 
you'll have your general unit no infections, then you'll, you can wear your gown if you choose to wear a gown uh, with that population. You may not need to wear a gown because there's no infection precautions. In some cases, we're doing that because we're um, concerned about the level of COVID positive in the community at large. Um, but if you've got a, a general unit where traditional residents and uh, you have a group of residents with a respiratory illness, you could do extended wear use of the same gown with residents with a like infection. And so you can wear the same gown with those residents, but if you have a resident across the hall with C. diff, you're gonna have to doff your gown for the rest in a respiratory patient area, and then you're gonna to have to go over to the other room where you have your C. diff patient and don a new gown. So extended wear is generally about wearing the same PPE with residents with the similar infections. Next slide, please. So that is a summary, I think I went a little over, of some of the principles to keep in mind. But I, this is from one of our facilities and I just had to share this. And I just admire what everyone is doing now. And our, our uh, team members across our entire post-acute long-term care sector are truly heroes at work. And I know that the hospital workers get a lot of accolades. I personally have chosen to work in this field because I think we have the most compassionate, passionate, skilled teams and are really, really care about our residents. And I just want to acknowledge that we truly have heroes at work and that each of you are heroes at work as well. And I'd like to close out with the next slide, please. And this is actually Mahalo for healthcare workers. And we have a facility in Honolulu where uh, the, in the apartment building across from the facility, they had placed this banner. And it's, I just was so touched by this. And since I, I thought you all would enjoy it as well, and it's, it's very much um, the, the most important sentiment today is our appreciation for our healthcare workers. And then my final slide, please. And I know this is a tough time. We're all living it. It's a new day. It's a new normal. I call it the new COVID normal. Uh, but I do believe that things will change for the better. And I wanna thank all of you for the work you do every day because, uh, because of you, you are making a huge difference in people's lives more now than ever. And I just wanna tell you how much I appreciate what you do every day. So now we can open for questions. Hi everyone, it's Dr. Wynn again. I just uh, wanna say thank you so much. That was really practical and I just wanna just highlight uh, for people that uh, when you go onto our website, all those references, uh, all those um, checklists, those are, take a look at them. They're really fantastic. It really walks you through in great detail how to you know, actually remove your gown meticulously and how to remove all those things. And there's videos as well. And so that is a fantastic resource. Make sure you look at that. And also I uh, wanted to also make sure that there is a page there called PPE Resources for Hawaii. Uh, try to uh, where you can order PPE, uh, including you know ordering from Mass for Hawaii or order from there's an organization called Kupuna Kokua and actually uh, on our chat box we've had uh, Eric uh, what's wait, 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 where is he here Erica Warkus actually on our chat box do you want to say something Erica? Well, I don't hear from Erica, but anyway, so she's working with, um, I, I'm going to encourage you guys to um, uh, um, order um, cloth masks, surgical masks, and hand sanitizers to facilities that are being donated uh, by some very generous person. And um, there is a, a website, um, the email and information you need to include, and you can go ahead and order that as soon as possible. And uh, Erica also, uh, I think she's a medical student. and. Um, uh, really proud of her for just pulling all of these things together for yeah. our healthcare community. But she awesome. is she also posted a whole bunch of, uh, I guess she found some uh, YouTube videos and, and things like that or, or patterns for, um, 
for face masks and laminators and things like that. So I'm going to include those into our PPE resources for Hawaii. It's going to continue to get updated. So look on uh, the website for that as well. Okay, now I can, oh, there she goes. Uh, yeah, there's information about that Kapua Kakuna, Kakua. Yes, those are excellent resources and very engaged community, which is exciting. Thank you guys. Um, so this, this is Erica. I'm, Hi, Erica. I do have an update. The donor um, has said that the mess they have available, we have filled that supply. Um, there is the potential that there is more. He's asking me to continue to submit the request. But for right now, we don't know how long it's gonna take for them to get to people. So I will continue to update you guys on that. Um, but thank you guys for um, the support and for signing up and I'll continue to update you as I find out more. Thank you. Okay, I know we are over. I'm sorry. I did go over. I didn't mean to. We're willing to linger a little bit if nobody minds lingering. Okay, let me just go look through here. Um, oh yeah, so somebody from uh, Mass for Hawaii um, is also has also uh, posted in here. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of things here, yeah. Uh, Nurse Molly says, I work in home care. We have given each caregiver a client a mask to wear during the shift. What is the best way for home care to reuse masks considering we don't have blanket warmers or UV lights? So the, uh, the response is, I would understand that for that would be to place them in a plastic bag, I mean, a, a paper sack when you have completed your shift. And then to inspect them, um, you could reuse them for your next visit or your next shift as long as they're not soiled or torn. So you'll need to inspect the mask. But um, we're finding that it's best to wash the cloth masks at the end of each shift. Uh, the surgical masks uh, maybe last an extra day, but usually, usually they're only lasting us about a shift. So we only, we calculate out a surgical mask per shift. And then we wash cloth masks between shifts. And the N95s can typically last up to five days. Um, and then I, I know, um, Dr. Wen, you had mentioned that there is a, there's a hospital in Honolulu that has offered to do some ultraviolet treatment, mm -hmm. but that's limited supply. So you may wanna check with other providers to see if you could arrange for ultraviolet treatment to be able to extend the use of the mask. Yes. Yeah. And there's um, a question. For a sec the UV. I'm sorry. Um, so a lot of them are finding that the UV just really breaks it down. It's not recommended for use to sanitize any of that stuff. That is what I've read. Is that true? Well, and that was the study that I just shared with you at Stanford. They gave the, spe the very specific specifications of the ultraviolet lighting that they used and that did not appear to break down the fibers. So I, it, based on that study, it sounds like if you use those specific ultraviolet waves, you may be able to um, not have a breakdown, as quick a breakdown of the fabric. I think it's still best practice if you have access to masks, to clean your cloth masks uh, after the end of your shift, um, and then also to change out surgical masks each day and change out N95s at least every five days. Okay, great. And, and uh, if you're wearing cloth masks, really they're, they're best served if you could put a face shield over the cloth mask. Okay, when removing N95, rubber bands easily touch the front of the mask. Any suggestions? That's a great question, um, but it does take practice uh, to, to make sure that you are anchoring with that as you're, as you're removing one, then you have to remove the second one 
and, and you do have to carefully bring the mask forward so it doesn't touch the front of the mask. If it touches the front of the mask, then it becomes contaminated, as you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a couple of other people have suggested some websites, which I think, you know, actually you've referenced and I've seen these as well. So these are also, these are quite good from Penny and from Annie, Andy, uh, uh, no. Um, so um, what if we run out of gloves? That's a, that's a great question, and we have not really went into that, but hand sanitization is, is absolutely critical. And there's probably levels of gloves that you would go to. The, the ones that we use routinely, the non-latex, uh, but you can also get the, the larger plastic gloves. Um, we, at this point, we have not seen a supply chain shortage of gloves. Um, and uh, I, I would need to actually research that. Outside of vigorous hand hygiene and <clears throat> using, um, using things like uh, tweezers to be able to make sure that you're using tweezers to wash out, uh, to clean out dressings, et cetera, to hold garments so that you're not touching the resident. There's some other things that I know in my distant past that I was acquainted with. Um, but right now, it looks like the supply chain has, has held up around gloves. Have you heard anything differently? No. Yeah, okay. Um, is there a protocol for washing or sanitizing uh, gloves if you're wearing them continuously? Okay, so this is a really good question. Uh, the CDC, I'm oh, sorry, my thoughts. Um, uh, the CDC recommends, um, that does in some of their PPE recommendations include using hand sanitizer on gloves, uh, especially when they talk about doffing of PPE, that you can use hand sanitizer on your gloves at that time. I will say though, this is the other component, the hand sanitizer is alcohol-based and it does degrade the glove. And so uh, we have opted to not use hand sanitizer on gloves at this point. And when I talked to some um, infection prevention specialists, uh, they do not recommend it necessarily either. But if you are starting to get in shorter supply of gloves, that would be a way to reduce the amount of gloves it takes to doff. Because when you doff your gown, you, um, you remove your dirty gloves you do hand hygiene, then you apply your clean gloves, and then you remove, you doff from the clean side out. Um, and so it would help you reduce the use of one pair of gloves in the doffing process. But that alcohol-based hand rub can degrade the texture of the gloves, and they're micro tears. So it's not something you're gonna see readily um, and so that you could risk the, the chance of contamination. Okay. Um, any recommendation for extended use or reuse of procedural masks? I guess that's the surgical mask. Well, procedural masks, so the surgical mask has a special filtration cloth. Procedural masks um, are like masks that uh, typically you'll find like at dental offices and uh, they may not use a surgical mask with that type of cloth. It's more of that melted foam, um, I think is what they call it. Um, that they are listed by the CDC to only be used when you're in contingency or crisis mode. So I would not recommend, um, I mean, I, I would recommend using the same principles, that you inspect them at the end of the shift if they're soiled or torn, you do not want to use them, but keep in mind the breath is moist and it could impact the filtration capability of the material that the mask is made out of because they are not, um, they are not approved as the con a conventional mask or a mask to be using when we're in conventional situations. Okay, so um, actually I'm going to just uh, make one last comment because we're kind of nearing the end and then I actually want to give people a little bit of time and space to give us 
feedback with regards to what types of um, uh, what, what kind of content they want to see in upcoming sessions uh, for this ECHO series. But anyway, uh, Sonia Winslet said, while we obtained some protection from a cloth or other mask, remember that technically it's not an N95. Your mask protects another person from you and their mask protects you from them. So yes, face shield over cloth mask. We use a mask over the N95 to decrease the risk of contamination of the N95 so we can use the N95 longer. You have more bravo masks than an N95. Stay safe and stay away from anyone who is not wearing a mask. So, yeah. Good reminders. That's good advice. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, um, so um, anyway, so I just want to open, just leave this uh, uh, link up open just a little bit longer for people to put in the Zoom chat um, any um, burning questions and topics that we will just collect um, uh, to, for use um, to make sure we address those issues uh, down the road. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. And uh, next week, oh, let me just uh, pull up my thing here. Not next week. It's, uh, it's uh, in two days. Yeah, so where is my, hold on. Um, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so anyway, for just a reminder, in order to get a certificate of attendance, go to our webpage, complete the online cert, uh, evaluation form. And there's a link at the uh, bottom of the email invitation and your comments are very important to us as we plan future programs. And um, so you can uh, obviously put your comments in there, but also I'm just encourage you to put them in the chat box and we're gonna record that uh, for, for uh, the future. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, keep updating all the resources as they come in and uh, uh, load them up on our uh, web page as well. So keep looking out for those as well. Thank you so much. Kathy, thanks for staying on extra long. Oh, you're I, welcome. There were lots of questions. I am sorry I went all over. I got a little carried away. <laughs> it's okay. It's always hard to do that. So. But lots of good information. Thank you. Okay, let's see what other, any other questions or comments come in. And Anyway, I'll, I'll email if you get further questions or comments. Okay. Thank you. So should I sign off? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for this. It was excellent. Thank you. It's a great group. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it.